大家好，那个呃，今天的这个分享呢，由由我啊，我是在从那个中国移动，然后我还有我的那个 From China Mobile, I also have a partner to join me for this session, Mr. Lu Bing from Arm. Currently, I'm responsible for two parts. One is Kubernetes, and now I'm a member of Kubernetes. Another part is for secure computing. So today, I will focus on these parts, which is based on Kubernetes and ARM platform. What are the potentially future applications? Also. Uh, we will know the needs of edge computing and also why Kubernetes fits more for these uh, scenarios. So before we officially start, I will make a survey among all of you. How many of you sitting here work for IoT-related design and R&D? Raise your hands. Thank you. So a following up question. If you raise your hand, how many of you use ARM? Only ARM, purely ARM, or any other um, platforms to be integrated? So when you develop IoT, uh, do you use ARM platform or the other platforms? So you're still on the upper end. For edge computing, Side. I just delivered this in 607, so I will share with you about this again. In terms of the operations, operators, the edge computing uh, relating to two parts. One is the network side edge computer, another is the on site. Edge computing. So today we'll focus on the on-site and in terms of how to architect your cloud and what business will it shoulder and how to reduce the cost. So first of all, I will anchor the on-site. Uh, great edge computing. In terms of IoT, what problems will come across in our industry? Actually, this is very clear in our sector. We cooperated with lots of enterprises. Now they're building smart city and smart buildings and also smart factories. A lot are based in the parks or campuses, and they actually don't want to enable their workflows to flow out of their parks and campuses, and we cannot control. So in terms of industrial scenarios, their protocols are ICANN or they, they are independent or the private protocols, not the IP protocols. So these protocols are not fitable for putting onto the cloud for management. So what should we do? How to integrate these capabilities on our industrial gateways to transfer the protocols and to connect the protocols. And uh, we can take the IP flow. So this is a new cloud scenario, and we need to integrate all distributed machines uh, for better administration. This is our first need. And also low latency. A lot of people will talk about the deployment of 5G. After this rollout, the latency has been reduced. But when we discuss with the industry, they have uh, not very high requirement for latency, but very high requirement and need for the distance. How to understand this at your home? We gave you a cable, and you can enjoy the video. The traffic and speed very sound, and also uh, you can enjoy this. But if we offer the internet service for the whole building, then sometimes the speed will be reduced. Broadband. Uh, bandwidth, no problem, but the speed has uh, problems. So which means if nobody use it, latency would be very low. But if lots of people use it, latency would be very high. So can you comprehend this as low latency? Yes, actually, it, it is. But in terms of uh, industrial scenarios, what they require is to control the time within 10 milliseconds. So if you reach 11 or 12 milliseconds, your system will break down. And they do need this uh, distance-based latency, low latency. So for the on-site devices, if you will manage them on-site, how to provide better distance 
best guarantee. In terms of standardization, now we're promoting the TSN networks for the corresponding uh, low latency investigation and also the data volume and uh, the bandwidth. So the data volume has exceeded the bandwidth and we have millions levels of uh, the quantity um, of devices. And also the wide area network connections are not reliable and very expensive. So in your home, Sometimes we will buy the small scale setup server. Within it, we will put our own HD video. No need for run. Uh, run it on the operator's network to play the video. No need to occupy the uh, bandwidth. Also, take this from the cost perspective. Assume we have deployed our services on the network side edge computing according to the pattern of the public cloud you need to pay every month for connections and you need to buy the storage every month you need to pay a bit money 10 yuan or 20 yuan not sure but you have to pay or you need to pay through ITE uh, monthly membership or you buy a device created at your home to provide very stable uh, video service for you and now lots of people are trying this or you buy a uh, USB yourself the cost is 40 50 yuan or um, you can um, purchase the other devices. So the users need, need to balance because edge computing focused on the cost orientation instead of the technology. So on site will also uh, show their loss of the value to serve. And also in terms of information safety uh, relates to personal privacy data and business data, very sensitive, and third party apps and third party programming designers. Now we have lots of uh, pilots, more than 90% scenarios are private, based in campuses and parks. So China Mobile can provide us the 5G infrastructure, but the traffic will not go out of their parks. So for consumers, they're still using their own private cloud, and their traffic are not um, they export it. So very safe. And in lots of vertical sectors, this is their need, because in the verticals, migration to cloud is very slow. And also with the edge computing, we will come across similar problems, because edge computing will come across similar problems to the cloud computing, unavoidable, in terms of uh, safety and security. Because for the public cloud, a security problem is different to the private. If we offer them edge, uh, the um, gateway or server services, then their traffic would not be exported out of the park and they can be connected to the container and this fits better for the market and also self-made locally fits for offline operation and uh, on-premise independent management administration higher reliability because it intrinsically has this self-made attribute we don't want to enable our gateway to uh, go through the breakouts. So we don't want to influence maybe uh, thousands of the IoT machines. Otherwise, edge computing would have no value. So uh, edge computing has the self-made attribute and persistent. Lots of people might have lots of solutions. Also can be used. But if the network come across problems, because the reliability of the edge is lower than data center. Sorry. What I mean is the reliability of edge computing cannot reach the reliability of the data center. So it's lower. So when we have the lower reliability, we need to consider the on premise management, which means I am a 
a kind of a, a weak manage, management or administration. We need to upload the data according to needs. So this is the uh, kind of a weak connection with the cloud. Another part is hardware config. Recently, Raspberry Pi just launched the Raspberry Pi version 4. Very good product. A Raspberry Pi can run ARM's uh, container. This guy from, is from ARM. Now the ARM architecture is based uh, in terms of IoT. It has the ecosystem and better than the other systems. And lots of phone, the run their architecture based on ARM. Another part is machine learning big data. Maybe you have your confusions. On the edge, the data is very small, limited, but you want to use it for big data processing. But it's not like this, because in AI and big data, we have reasoning and learning. In terms of training and learning, for training specifically, we still think that it's reasonable to be put into the data center, not in edge, and not in the cloud of edge computing because of the precious resources. So what can I do? Reasoning. We have the models very uh, ready, and we can input the models into our phone or the data center of edge computing. So if we have the video streaming, we can use a model to process it directly, and that backend, we can modify the model. So in terms of edge computing, we have the AI, and also on our phone, uh, we have the identification services or the image identification relating to AI. Also here, a cost is a concern. For example, of course, uh, maybe my deep diver not very clear. Uh, say we have a manufacturer from Hangzhou based in Hangzhou. They work for a camera. The cost or the price is two thousand. Their camera price is two thousand, and. They can provide face recognition service, which means when we collect data, we have um, provide identification or recognition services for your face. And uh, the accuracy is 60 to 70 percent, because the chip processing capability is very small within the camera. After processing, they need to migrate the traffic into the edge um, data processing center, this is one mode. Another mode is they only provide camera, maybe only 40 or 50 yuan. And for the information capture, and they directly uh, export the traffic into data center. In the future, with the edge computing 5G, there will be lots of traffic, maybe for free. So what they should do is to rent the edge computer VM or CPU to process the corresponding face recognition uh, information, which means these are two options for them. So in terms of the manufacturer perspective, I want to sell out more and the price higher. But from the holistic view, the camera, will we integrate lots of the AIs on the camera? This would be dependent on the integrated cost and price of our solution. Because you buy a camera, the cost would be only 40 to 50 yuan. And if you integrate AI applications on the front end, the camera would be 2,000 yuan. But on the road, on the street, in the intersection, you need about 16 cameras. So the cost is very high. If we offer this cloud service on the remote end, maybe the cost would be reduced. Because the payment method, the charging method, um, now is not set yet. So we will take parallel ways. And now we need this infrastructure augmentation to improve the capability of Edge in order to expand its ecosystem. 
This is CNC NAV and edge computing. What kind of a connection partnership have we forged? In lots of uh, uh, the open source projects, you may find uh, the Kubernetes project. Why we have this? Because in the current Kubernetes environment, all nodes are ARM nodes. Uh, these uh, scale very small, maybe dozens of or hundreds of. Lots of topics today will show with you that we are responsible for maybe thousands of clusters, but actually there are no quantity very small, but on the edge. Sorry, I'll skip this part, the Kubernetes architecture. Okay. On the edge, the device's uh, quantity would increase. How these devices work as a Kubernetes nodes to have better management. You can see here there are lots of devices, and we will have Kubernetes controllers, etc. But actually, very hard to manage, very hard to install. For an IoT device, this is too large. As I mentioned before, lots of problems, including communication. So it will come across all these communi all these problems. We can go through Kubernetes to standardize these devices and to manage them all and uh, to manage this as the gateway to provide this to the customer. Next, my colleague Lu Bing will come to stage. Thank you, Jia Quan. While uh, my colleague mentions that the smart cities and other smart projects with IoT would bring us some challenges, and one of them is that uh, through CNCF, can we manage so many IoT devices? So let's have an overall review of them. Well, um, Actually, it is already up to the industrial standard, and we're thinking about using Kubernetes to manage all of these infrared and Bluetooth devices, for example, your Bluetooth speakers, loudspeakers, and your infrared ACs to be all managed with IoT. Then let's look at the architecture. Uh, for the Kubernetes edge. This is a very typical Kubernetes uh, architecture, master's level, master's level architecture. And uh, maybe in the future, we can see many uh, big changes on the master level. And uh, this one is a very typical master's level architecture. And as Jiaquan mentioned, in the future, our IoT cloud would be all supported locally. And uh, the current master's level architecture is not feasible for that. If you remove the cable, network cable here, then on the edge, the slave one, two could not support, uh, and uh, it could not select or communicate and synchronize the local data. And another would be on the slave end. And there are some core progresses, three of them. The first is about Kubernetes, Kubernetes and the second is about CNI. Uh, it might be about Frango or Kaneko, and the third would be Kubi Proxy, which is about service discovery, etc. So these call, three core progresses would be critical, and if you go to check their memory footprint, you would find them very high. And uh, for the gateways for IoT, they would have very small, limited storage. So these three core progresses are like very Thorough changes in Kubernetes, and we would remove the unnecessary service and applications. But still, in each of these progresses, the corresponding modules should still include network, discover, uh, service discovery, and container management. And uh, they would all be updated respectively. For example, for CNI, the Kube Edge would upgrade it to a distributed CNI. Or, as Jiaquan mentioned, here. Uh, 
about information security. Uh, the Secure networking would be important. In Quebec, the network is not only distributed, but also secure with a VPN channel. And of course, we need to realize the local autonomy of this system. And in the Kubi proxy and in the Kubnet, they should all realize the edge node communication which is distributed and also to have some selection to synchronize the data not only on the API server on the masters so this is the current Kubernetes architecture for a huge IoT cloud in the future, if you include the device discovery into it, maybe the Kubi Master Management would be probably up to millions of devices. And if you use Kubernetes to manage this IoT cloud, what challenges? may we have, but uh, this slide is about its main advantages. Um, at present, Kubernetes, as a container orchestration, it has a general uh, application abstraction and about the dual co coupling. And then let's look at the challenges we may face. Uh, as I said, the IT, IoT cloud would be totally different with our traditional data centers. So the first challenge would be about limited resource. Limit, uh, and uh, it, may, it means that the gateways compared with the server level hardware would have limited resources, for example, a vulnerable CPU and limited storage. And the second challenge would be about the restricted network, which means in our data center we may use Kubernetes to manage our private cloud. But in KubeEdge, uh, the APSO maybe in the machine room of China Mobile, for example, and the gateway is in your community, in your neighborhood. It might be your home routers or the exchanges in the buildings, and they should communicate with the a certain could be master, and it will be through internet, but the latency would be severe, and it would be very highly costed, and it is not reliable. So it may cause a very long delay or even interruption. And then about the local autonomy, we know that in Kubernetes, each Kubeslave node would have a local cache, and it would have a primary data communication. And uh, in the IoT scenario, because Kubemaster is not reliable, it is likely to be interrupted at a certain time point, and at the cloud and at the edge, it could not communicate normally. So can we let each edge to discover their um, front edge and uh, to have the primary data communication then, and also to discover the primary data with the new labels and update together. This is about the local economy. And then about IoT device discovery. You know that in the Kubernetes cluster, it does not support IoT device discovery. If you use the Xiaomi device, you may know that we could evolve a lot of Xiaomi devices into the Xiaomi system. And here it is similar. We could evolve a large number of infrared, GPU or Bluetooth devices into the gateway, and the gateway could send it as a primary data to the Kubi Master, and then in the China Mobile Machine Rooms Kubi Master, it could have an overall management of these millions of infrared and Bluetooth devices. And then concerning Kubi Edge, it is now under CNCF, an open source project. 
And uh, for the time being, KubeEdge uh, is based on uh, Kubernetes, 100% compatible with Kubernetes API. And uh, it has customized edge node uh, components and runtime. So for each slave, Kubernetes and Kube proxy would be replaced with edge core and it could be in a distributed manner. And it has a reliable uh, messaging pathway. It means we have a pub sub for the registration of these Bluetooth and infrared uh, devices. And for our internet devices or home uh, hardware, we do not want to lose them. So we have a more reliable pathway for them. And we also have an edge offline um, autonomy. It means at any time point, it could be interrupted by the Kubernetes, and it could also have have the real-time synchronous updating with, it, with their uh, corresponding nodes. And we also have a very enriched application and protocol support to support all types of devices. And it also has a simplified device on access. And then let's look at the overall framework for Cube Edge. From the application's perspective, for Kube Edge, its application would be very simple. And on the Kube Master, there is an Edge controller. And uh, at each slave, it uh, adds an Edge call. Memory footprint of Edge call compared with the three core progresses on the Kubernetes slave, it is much more streamlined and could be run on the 100 MB gateway. And for the Edge controller, it is on the cloud, and uh, it could synchronize the edge nodes and the application status for service to the primary data, and it could introduce the abstract API, for example, for infrared um, devices or for Bluetooth loudspeakers. It could. Um, have this um, abstract API of the devices. And uh, the Edge Core is also uh, exclusive for this IoT system with an extra device de discovery function. This is a uh, discovery of the uh, devices. And uh, we also introduce Edge Call, uh, which means on each uh, slave and it, there is an Edge Core to manage the application on the Edge nodes and to realize the runtime for the pod in a light way, which means it is a very lightweight Kubernetes. And then for this, which is like the core or the soul of Coop Edge, and we need to pay attention to four things. The first is Edge Hub, and then the Meta Manager about the metadata service, and then the HD, a mini Kubernetes, and uh, also MQTT, the fourth one which is for discovering devices. And for MQTT thread, we could pop all the discovered devices onto the master. And then let's uh, look at these four modules one by one. The first is Kubibus which is like a CNI plus Kubi proxy in the Kubernetes, which is like a channel for distributed routing and VPN uh, offering a secure network. And then for Kubibus, it uh, has the following important functions. First, through the VPN channel, it wants to connect all the edge nodes 
and for each edge node, it could at least discover another one. And the second function would be to guarantee the communication between edge node and cloud. And uh, the third one would be about discovery of the service, uh, which is similar to that of Kube Proxy. It is like the uh, load balance. And uh, then about the metadata service on the edge, because the edge node would be connected with the cloud through internet, which is not reliable with a very narrow bandwidth. So for metadata, it uh, evolves the following important features. First, this service is quite uh, long-lasting. If the connection between the edge node and the cloud is recovered, and then it could be synchronized to the edge cloud. And because of the narrow bandwidth and uh, on the instability of uh, a high cost of internet, then the synchronization is in an uh, incremented way. It is not as what we used to have. It is to synchronize the increment in the recent time period to reduce the network flow. And uh, the third would be about the decentralized metadata service. As we mentioned for Kubibus, it could make sure of communication between the um, relative uh, edge nodes, and if here the edge nodes could be selected by their relative edge nodes, and then it could be synchronized. And uh, then about the uh, discovery of the devices, for Bluetooth devices it is okay now. So. For the time being, on the ARM platform, including ARM32 and ARM64, Cube Edge is uh, available, and you could download it and try it on the ARM platforms. And then for the Cube Edge, we still need to further some key features like the unified management of the Cloud Edge, the config map and uh, more device recovery should be involved as well. And uh, the roadmap is here um, through the link. Uh, and you can have a look at this for each edge node. Each edge core could completely simulate a SLA function, and on the Kube master, you can see it's 100% IPR compatible, and it is uh, not different at all from uh, normal SLA. And this edge call progress is very critical in the slab. Can I zoom it in so that you can see it more clearly? So at present, as an edge node, its behavior is totally the same as that of a slave. On the edge node, we can even deploy an HTD symbol. In this example, we're using a node pod. Okay. 
目前来说，在 ARM 上已经是呃都已经 ready 了。So on ARM currently now everything is ready. Uh, for the next step, we need to introduce new features. So this is the end of my presentation and our demo. Any question? Um, sorry, the interpreter didn't hear the question because there's no microphone. And the answer is like, um, the Cooper Edge is like to distribute. Um, to distribute the three core progresses on the Kubernetes. And as I said, the core thinking here is about the um, synchronization of the data, metadata, in by their increment. Well, is it also connected to the cloud? Yes, because I said the Kubi bus is like a CNI and a Kubi proxy, and it adopts a VPN uh, channel, and it could make sure the master slave and slave slave communication, and it also has a load balance and a service discovery function, so as to make sure of local autonomy and the relative edge node could select and synchronize their metadata. You mentioned the relative uh, edge nodes, but for the millions of devices, maybe their relative nodes would also be up to millions. Well, the million level means the Bluetooth and infrared devices in the gateway, for example, your water heater, your, blue, uh, your Bluetooth loudspeaker, and also your air conditioners at home. Um, actually, on um, the million level of uh, gateway would be less in an order of magnitude than the edge nodes. While well, you mentioned the one in one of your slides about the features of edge computing, maybe in the first slide, and it mentions about information security. And I would like to know that when you use edge computing in information security. Do you have any a specific use case? Well, as I said, the Kubi bus would offer a VPN channel to make sure of the network security and then the security about the run time. We now have Kata and GVisor, uh, and uh, Kata is ready on the ARM. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about G-Visor on ARM. I have another presentation on that. Uh, well, I understand that um, some devices may contain some uh, sensitive data, and uh, maybe it could uh, run on the nodes or locally. Can you use your platform to deploy the whole architecture? Yes, maybe you can uh, make it a new feature. And uh, in our group, you could uh, initiate it for uh, more um, discussion involving more people. It may evolve the secure data design. And have you compared HX together with Gateway yet? Not yet. We can regard HX as the um, fundamental operation platform. Before we discuss this with uh, their uh, operators, so Kubernetes can work as the coordinator on the cloud, but HX is a kind of a carrier on the edge. Uh, on the edge. Sorry, um, I have used up my time, so I can have communication with you offline. I personally think that Kubernetes fits for this. Thank you.